Hi everyone. Shall we make a start? Welcome. I'm glad we booked the bigger room because you would have been sitting on the floor in the other lecture theatre that we had booked originally. Um, I'm Victoria Clark from UWE. This is Ginny Brown and it's Brown, not Braun. So you now know how to pronounce her last name correctly all the way from the University of Auckland. Um, and what we're going to do today is give you an introduction to our particular approach to thematic analysis. So this is intended as an introductory lecture in case the title and introduction didn't give that away. So what we do is we give you a bit of context surrounding our approach and then we we'll talk you through the practicalities of how to implement it and highlight some potential kind of traps and pitfalls to avoid. So who are we? And why do we get to talk about thematic analysis? Um, I should say, before I launch into that, two quick pieces of housekeeping. So we talk for about an hour, and then we'll have a Q&A for up to an hour. We're going to finish dead on four, because unfortunately my dog is very unwell. And my dad is emergency dog sitting, and I need to get back to him as soon as possible. So the last time I gave a lecture, there was the lecture, the Q&A, and then the one-on-one -on -one Q&A after the Q&A that my colleague Miltos very kindly rescued me from eventually. Um, so if you do have questions, please answer them in the formal Q&A session because we will be heading off straight afterwards and we won't have time for kind of personal one-on-one -on -one conversations. I'm sorry about that. As much as we love talking about thematic analysis, I do slightly love my dog a little bit more <laughs> and want to get back to him and make sure he's okay. Okay, so those are the two bits of um, housework. So who are we? And why do we think we have something to say about thematic analysis? So for those, that you, of, those of you who don't know, um, we wrote a paper in 2006, published in 2006, in the journal Qualitative Research in Psychology called Using Thematic Analysis in Psychology. And much to our surprise and amusement, it, came, it became rather popular. In actual fact, it has now well, not now, it probably has more now, but when I was, um, when we were putting the slides together, we checked, and on Google Scholar, it has over 40,000 citations. Google Scholar have started to produce citation classic reports, and they say it's the most cited academic paper published in 2006. That sort of does our head in a bit, those kind of statistics, they seem quite overwhelming. Um, why are we telling you this? Not simply to show off, but to uh, um, try and signal the popularity of our approach, the fact that it's widely used, that there's often a suspicion that um, thematic analysis isn't as good as other approaches. And so to start off by reassuring that it is a legitimate and very widely used approach. So if someone tells you, oh, you can't use TA in a doctorate, well, you can say, Look at all these citations, look at how much it's being used in published research. So we wrote a paper in 2006 and we've been writing about thematic analysis and qualitative research ever since. So the other thing I really want to signal is that our ideas and our thinking have evolved and continue to evolve. We've learnt about thematic analysis more and more. We've learnt about qualitative research more and more. I don't think you ever reach a point in qualitative research where you can ever stop learning. And our writing and our ideas have shifted as our understandings have developed. So if you are wanting to use our approach and you just rely on the 2006 paper, you're missing out on all the ways our ideas and thinking have shifted over the last 12 or so years. So we would, and we have these, because we like to amuse ourselves, a little alerts throughout the lecture. And one of them is if you're using our approach to not just rely on the original paper, but to try and engage with some of our more recent writing, so you can get a sense of how our ideas and our thinking have evolved. One thing that we've got much better at is understanding how our approach fits within other approaches to thematic analysis. And there are many, there are dozens, there are scores of other approaches to thematic analysis. It won't be something that we dwell on today, 
Um, I gave a lecture previously back in November, it's on YouTube, and in that lecture I talk about how our approach fits with all the other different approaches. So that's another big alert as well, to understand there isn't one approach to TA, and our approach is very different from some of the other approaches out there, both in terms of procedure but also in terms of underlying philosophy. If you, we've got a TA website um, at the University of Auckland and that is reasonably, reasonably up to date. It's where we list all our publications and so on. So that's a good place to check into occasionally to see if we've published anything. So that's the preamble. So what we're going to talk about today is what is TA, very briefly, talk about probably the most um, central unique feature of TA, which is its flexibility when compared to other qualitative analytic approaches. And then we'll talk you through the six phases of our approach. Okay, so what is thematic analysis? So when we wrote our 2006 paper, we talked about it as an approach that was poorly demarcated, rarely acknowledged, yet widely used. Um, and what we meant by that is lots of people write papers and do research in which they claim to identify themes, but they often don't discuss how they did that, how those themes were created and generated, what procedures they drew on, what theoretical assumptions inform their work. So our intent in writing the 2006 paper was to write hopefully, a really accessible guide to doing thematic analysis and a guide that captured what we feel is the, the spirit of qualitative inquiry. So lots of other approaches still have, I was going to say a toe, but I'd say a foot and perhaps a leg as well in positivism, in number crunching and a concern with reliability and so on. But our approach, we see it as fully qualitative in that it's not just the use of qualitative tools and techniques, but it's also underpinned by a qualitative philosophy. So in recent years, with our approach being quite popular, but also generating much wider interest in thematic analysis, that increasingly TA is seen as a method in its own right. But there's still some worry and anxiety around that, that it's not sophisticated enough, that it can't do all the exciting, interesting things that you can do with IPA and grounded theory. And hopefully in this lecture, we reassure you that TA can be as unsophisticated or as sophisticated as you like. What's key is not the procedures that you're drawing on, but you as the researcher. You are the key to your research, research being sophisticated and conceptual and so on. So TA is quite simply a method for identifying and analysing patterned meaning within data. And Themes might seem quite straightforward that we all know what there is, but there's lots of debate and discussion around what exactly a theme is. We'll talk a bit about that in this lecture, but for a really good grounding on that, I'd go back to my November lecture because I look at some of the different definitions that exist across different approaches. So it can just be an approach for identifying themes, but ideally it's an approach that goes beyond that and offers some interpretation, some deep thinking about the significance and the meaning and the implications of the patterns that have been identified. I can sense Ginny moving, which means shut up, Victoria. It's my turn to speak now. So Ginny's going to take you through the rest of the context and background. Thank you. Hi, everyone. So I'm going to talk through some of the kind of contextualizing um, things and information and things that you need to think about before you sort of get started into the exciting bit, uh, which is, you know, wrangling your data and making sense of it. Um, and then Victoria's going to start talking about that and I'll come back at the end. We're mixing it up to um, keep you awake. Right. I think the kind of key takeaway um, message around our approach to thematic analysis is around 
flexibility. And that's because thematic analysis offers a method, um, a way of analyzing data rather than a whole framework for um, doing analytic scholarship. Um, approaches like discourse analysis, approaches like IPA, they're bound into particular theoretical, epistemological, ontological, those kind of um, big kind of theoretical ideas and assumptions. Um, but we're, our approach just offers a kind of way of engaging with making sense of what's going on in the data. Now that doesn't mean that you don't have to deal with those bigger questions, but they're not kind of tied into it, and that makes it very flexible um, and gives you a whole range of different options for what you can do with it. And some of the things that Victoria's already kind of touched on relate to this kind of key point. So we kind of highlighted three, I guess, broad continua and they are not binaries, not either rows, but continua that um, thematic analysis can be kind of located on or done within. Um, and so one of these is thinking about your coding and analysis from within a more inductive or within a more deductive framework. So an inductive framework is where you're really um, sort of working from the ground up, from the bottom up, from the data up. Uh, your focus on meaning, uh, is grounded in what's in the data, the sorts of explicit things that people are saying, their interpretative frameworks, those sorts of ideas. Um, and a deductive, a more deductive approach is a more sort of theoretical orientation to the data. So you're, you've got particular questions that are kind of driving your analysis rather than kind of seeing what's in the data and letting that sort of give the analysis some direction. Now in reality those things are often a bit mish mishmashed together and often our analysis is a bit of both but we tend to be primarily one or primarily the other in how we kind of approach a project. How you design a project kind of speaks to that question of whether you're more inductive or deductive in your orientation. The next one is a more kind of experiential or critical um, orientation. So um, we've cut, we really like this way of chopping up the field of qualitative research, like an experiential framework, which is kind of capturing people's meanings, people's lives, people's realities, what's going on for people. Um, interpretation that's grounded in the sort of reality of people's lives versus or stretching across two, because it's a continuum, not a binary. Uh, a more critical orientation, a more questioning orientation, a more um, interrogative approach where you're kind of asking what's going on here, what sort of sense is being made, how is this kind of thing possible in the data. So you're not using the sorts of accounts that you have in your data as the kind of um, end point for what you're looking at, they're kind of the point that, um, the starting point for kind of um, unpinning or unpacking what's going on. It's a different type of um, orientation. I think that word's useful because it sort of signals how we look at the data, the sorts of things that sort of grab us or um, puzzle us or intrigue us or the things that we want to think about more. And then the third of these is a more critical realist um, through to a more constructionist theoretical perspective. So are we treating our data as giving us access to some kind of reality, some kind of situated or located truth about, say, experience or meaning or practice that people are engaged in? Or are we interested in how the particular topic of our research is understood, is framed, is put together, how a certain reality is kind of being made and constructed um, in the data that we have? And that really is a kind of big, broad, philosophical framework for our research. And thematic analysis can sit along these three continua, and often they kind of align together. And it's not a rule that they have to align together, but often uh, more experiential approaches align with more kind of critical realist approaches, align with more inductive approaches. But it's not perfect, and I think, you know, We've often been kind of interpreted as saying really kind of hard and fast rules, and we're not saying really hard and fast rules. A lot of these things are kind of 
often common practices or principles, but you need to be thinking about these things and you need to be making choices and being active um, and deciding um, where it is that you sit on these things. And so one of our other kind of alerts is that um, when we say it's flexible, when we say it's theoretically flexible, we say you can choose uh, where it sits. You don't get to then not choose that and just ignore those whole kinds of questions. It's not about um, an atheoretical approach. It's not um, an inherently realist approach where it's just an approach to kind of discover things, um, discover reality. Um, it's an approach that can be located in all these different theoretical frameworks and you have to make that choice. So theoretical flexibility does not mean atheoreticality and it does not mean um, one particular theoretical approach, i.e. a kind of realist or post-positivist type of research. And I've kind of already said this in lots of different ways, but um, it means you need to be kind of actively engaged in the process as a researcher. So what that means is that you make a series of choices as to how you're using thematic analysis. Um, and what's really important is you not only understand that you're doing that and why you're doing that, uh, but that you explain that. So you're using it in a critical realist and an experiential way. Good. Why? How does that suit your research question? Tell the reader, the marker, if it's a, a dissertation or a thesis, uh, the reader, if it's an article, something like that, why that particular type of approach was important. What sorts of theoretical locations uh, or theories did you use to locate your research and why? So unlike some of those broader methodologies where this comes kind of pre-packaged for you, you kind of in TA actually have to put a whole lot of thinking into this and really engage. And I think that's a, that's a nice um, retort or response to the suggestions which Victoria raised about the way in which TA can often be seen as far too simplistic or too simple or not really um, allowing sophistication. We're saying you actually have to do a whole lot of thinking around this stuff and that is a good thing for the qualitative research that you will do. So we've found, as Victoria said, our approach has been used a lot and in a lot of different ways. And so um, this flexibility means that the product of TA that you might read about or see um, can be hugely varied. Some of them are really great. Some of them have some, what should we say, challenges um, in the applications. But really, you can, you can as we talked about, do TA in this essentialist way, more contextualist, um, critical realist, phenomenological way, um, constructionist way. There's different kinds of mashups where TA is being used kind of in concert with other methodological approaches. It's a popular approach within uh, mixed method research, but uh, maybe we won't open that can of worms. That could be a whole other lecture maybe next year. Um, you get it um, as a method being used often in applied research because um, sometimes I think it's seen as an easy way to get the sorts of answers applied research has, ethnography, participatory in action research type approaches and so on. And that's really kind of highlighting the way it can be a method that serves the tools of a greater kind of research design. Um, ethnography would usually, for instance, use a whole lot of different methods um, for data collection. And it works really well um, with a whole lot of different modes of different data collection and different data types. We like playing around with qualitative research and we've used TA with a whole lot of different, um, different sorts of qualitative data and it's worked really well. Um, it doesn't answer every question that you might have, but it answers a whole lot of different research questions. So some of us might be interested in understanding experiences or practices or how people make sense of things. It does that. Uh, if you're a more critical researcher and you're interested in understanding 
like the, the rules that govern society or the norms or the representational practices or the constructions of an object, it does that. One example around the cultural rules, for instance, I had a master's student who looked at young heterosexual women's experiences of being single and what her analysis eventually evolved into um, was in the identification of four rules of single heterosexual femininity that were very narrowly and tightly constrained and that these women felt their lives were um, governed by. So it works in a whole lot of um, different ways and like theory that means in terms of design you also have to think about what you're doing, why you're doing it, how you're doing it and so on. And what that means is that what comes out in the analysis can vary quite a lot. So when we wrote our 2006 paper, um, we talked about the variation between a more kind of straightforward type of analysis that is sort of more descriptive, more summative, might be seen as kind of giving voice to participants, um, and a, a more sort of quote unquote sophisticated or nuanced or complex analysis that kind of tells a story, um, provides the sort of interpretative context of that story, something that qualitative research is really um, valued for and is a really important in the kind of broader qualitative um, paradigm. Um, crucially is interpretative that tells us what's interesting about the data and why it's interesting and why and how it gives us something that answers the research question. It, might, it makes an argument, it, it serves a purpose and it is theoretically and conceptually located. And Victoria kind of highlighted that we've shifted our thinking and one of the things that we've shifted is realizing how we kind of assumed people would read the paper from the same point that we were coming from. It's not always the case. And so we sort of assumed that what we might get is most people kind of using TA in this more kind of quote unquote sophisticated way, um, but there would be some that kind of were serving a sort of a, a more descriptive purpose with their analyses and so on. But that they would understand that interpretation, for instance, is always part of the analytic process. But what we've found, I think, is that uh, this sort of framework has been taken up far more than we would have um, imagined. And also that interpretation is not necessarily seen as a kind of crucial part of that. And so that sense in which analysis is an interpretative process, it's a process of storytelling, um, hasn't been so built in. So um, the take home message from that really is to aim for recognising um, the value of interpretation and the essentialness of it the whole time. And the kind of final point I think before we get on to um, the kind of process and the doing of thematic analysis is the importance of reflexivity. Because this doesn't come to you, as I've said, you know, because it doesn't come to you ready made, you've got to be making choices. But the choices we make always reflect where we come from and who we are, the contexts, the possibilities, the constraints of the environment that we're in. So you have to as part of this process, reflect on uh, what you're doing and why you're doing it and how you're doing it and the assumptions that might underpin the reading of your data. So you will have a theory of language, for instance, that is part of the analysis that you're doing. But you might not think that you've got a theory of language unless you're doing kind of critical or constructionist research and so you've had to think about what language means. But if you're doing kind of an experiential approach where you're treating the language as giving you access to people's points of views, people's experiences, people's understandings of something, that is a theory, that is um, a framework for theorising language. And that's something that impinges on the analysis that you do. So that's a, that's a 
kind of example of a, a theoretical assumption or a conceptual assumption, assumption that might be inbuilt into what you're doing. Um, but you've also got your own values, your own positionings, your own take on things, your experiences, your own uh, disciplinary traditions and so on, which all shape how you see the data and how you're reading the data. Another example related to disciplinary assumptions I think that I think we see very, very commonly is lots of students wanting to use concepts like body image to talk about what's going on in relation to data. Now that's a theoretical construct that comes out of one particular psychological tradition. It's gone kind of viral and has taken over the world as an idea, but it comes with a whole lot of assumptions embedded in it. So something like body image is not a theoretically neutral construct. So that's why reflecting on what you bring in from your discipline um, is really important in how we read the data. So our alerts around this are trying to avoid unacknowledged assumptions. Now we can never be perfect at this. Reflexivity is always a kind of ongoing task. Um, but we are encouraging the kind of embedding of reflexivity throughout the analytic process. And having other people you can talk to or a supervisor, people who will question your readings can be really useful in interrupting um, the kind of embedding of assumptions in unwittingly. And then our mega mega alert, which is um, <laughs> something that we're um, possibly a little bit obsessed by, um, but is this idea of the researcher as active. The researcher engages with the data, the researcher works to make sense of the data from the positions that they bring, from the theoretical disciplinary knowledge that they have and so on. So they are engaging with the data to generate an analysis, the themes. And Please don't say they emerge, please. <laughs> we get greyer every time we read something that says themes emerge. But it's very, very commonly used as language. But what it sort of suggests is that they're just waiting there for you to discover. They're just kind of sitting there in the data and you just kind of looked at it and eventually they bubbled up to the surface like dumplings that are cooked and then you could, you know, just scoop them out. But it's not like that. It's the wrong kind of metaphor for the process. Um, and it suggests a very passive researcher in that process. So after today, no, emer no, uh, no themes emerging in thematic analysis. Right. Okay, so six phases. I want to straight away go into an alert we're talking about six phases because when thinking about, well, what do we call our approach to TA? If we're acknowledging there are lots of different approaches, what do we call it? And one name that we considered was the six phase approach, but we didn't want to reify those and see those phases as like a ladder that you climb up. So we have another alert that it isn't a process that's straightforward that you get on and it takes you to the top and you're done that the idea of climbing a ladder or passively standing on an escalator and allowing it to travel you to the top with your themes emerging as you <laughs> rise <laughs> um, isn't a great metaphor for thinking about our, our approach. Um, I think, that, is this a field of wheat? I wanted a field of wheat just because I am endlessly entertained by Theresa May running through her fields of wheat. <laughs> um, <laughs> So th the metaphor that we've used in some of our writing is that it's best to think of the approach as like following a coiled hose through some long grass. Is it's coiled and you're going backwards and forwards following the pathway, that it's not a straightforward approach, that it's not a linear approach, that it's a recursive approach, that you don't do one step and then you finish it completely and you move to the next. That in laying out a procedure, for doing analysis, we've often been accused of being proceduralists, 
that we're fixated on the procedure and that couldn't be further from how we think about qualitative research. We think of qualitative research as something that's messy, creative, interpretive. What we were trying to do was give people a starting point and a springboard into messy, complex, qualitative research. So um, playing on the subtitle of one of Carla Willig's books, we think of our approach as a recipe for starting your adventure. That it's um, an approach that gets you started on your journey, but it's not something that you want to rigidly cling to once you develop your skills around qualitative inquiry. So it's a starting point, but you don't have to, as your skills and your experience as an analyst develop, keep rigidly following this procedure. That it suggests the kind of techniques that more experienced researchers might use quite intuitively. So when we develop the approach, um, we try to think about, well, what do we do? When we analyse qualitative data, what is it that we're doing? and try to unpack that and break that apart. So, just very quickly before we leap into the phases, um, if you're using interview data or any kind of audio or video recorded data, you'll need some kind of transcription process. There's no particular required notation system for thematic analysis, but we do see an awful lot of people saying the data were transcribed like what, how, how exactly, what are assumptions are you making in transcribing your data? Transcription isn't merely something that's technical. Again, like any aspect of qualitative research, it has theoretical assumptions embedded in it. In our 2013 textbook, there's a notation system. It's a very thorough one, but it's one that we would recommend for TA. So again, with any aspect of qualitative inquiry, you're thinking about the theoretical assumptions that are embedded, that you're not viewing things purely as procedural. Okay, so the first step in thematic analysis is pretty much the first step in most forms of qualitative analysis, which is getting to know your data immersing yourself in your data. If you've collected your data yourself, you're at an advantage because that process of collecting, of writing kind of notes on the interviews will already start to immerse you. If you have collected audio or video recorded data and you transcribe it yourself, again, you're getting that second layer of immersion. So when it comes to looking at the data, you've already sort of bedded in with it quite a bit. You're quite familiar with its content, but you've got to know it a little bit. Often, if you're a university lecturer like us, someone else collects your data for you, and you have to make sense of data that you haven't collected. So familiarisation is always important, but it becomes especially important if you didn't collect your data, if you didn't transcribe your data. So you're engaging with your data. You're not just passively reading it, you're actively reading it and thinking about what's going on here. How can this account the participant has given me make sense? How would I feel in this situation? You're constantly asking yourself all these critical questions to kind of get you into the data. Sometimes when I read data for the first time, I sort of have a panic and a meltdown and go, oh my God, there's nothing in it. There's nothing useful. How am I going to make any sense of this? And then you read and you read and you read and then you'll swing to the opposite side and say, oh my God, there's too much in it. It's too rich, it's too complex. How can I possibly summarise it? But it's that process of familiarisation that takes you to seeing the richness and complexity in your data. So what we recommend for this phase is making some notes. It's not systematic as it would be for coding, which is the next part of the process, but it's starting to reflect on what you can see, what's of interest, what leaps out at you. You might want to also reflect on or try to reflect on the assumptions that you're making in coding the data. 
What am I bringing to this from my disciplinary background, from my understanding of the topic, from my own experience? So it's a process of actively starting to actively engage in the data, starting to think analytically about the data and recording those initial observations and those initial ideas. You can do it for each data item. So for example, an interview would be a data item, a focus group would be a data item. And then you might want to do it for the whole kind of process. I say might because it's what works for you. It's what helps you to unpack your data. So although we make these recommendations, they are just recommendations for what we think is useful. It's not sort of laws you have to obey, otherwise we come and find you in the middle of the night and tell you off for not doing TA correctly. <laughs> so familiarization is the first stage, reading and rereading. If you didn't collect the data and you've got audio data, you probably want to go back and listen to it. You've made some notes and then you're moving into coding. And coding is the first really systematic part of the data analysis process. And I'm just going to skip forward to the alerts here. Because what often people do, and I experience this every year when I teach thematic analysis, is students go straight into thinking about what the themes are and what the themes could be. You might want to note some potential ideas, but you really want to push them aside. Because often, our initial impressions of what themes can be are quite superficial and at the surface of the data. And the more complex, more interpretive themes that go beyond the obvious are things that come through with time and reflection. They're not things that immediately leap out at you. And it's not about being a uh, really good and experienced data analyst and being an inexperienced one. It's not like um, when you're more experienced, the really complex themes kind of jump out at you straight away. It really is a process of time and reflection that you have to allow to unfold. So what's distinctive about our approach to TA is we think of codes as things, as analytic entities. Whereas most other approaches conceptualize coding as a process, whereas we think coding produces little things, and then you build your themes, generate your themes from those little things. So codes cluster together, or you cluster codes together to build and generate themes. So a code is a label that captures something that's interesting in the data. It really is that simple. We'd avoid um, one word code names because you're trying to get sort of deeper into the data and it's unlikely that one word like stigma or gender is really sort of getting in there. We were making sauerkraut the other day and I think that's a good metaphor. If you've ever made sauerkraut and you're massaging that cabbage and you're really getting in there, that's what you kind of want to do with your coding, that you're really kind of getting into the data. Coding, you want to do it systematically. So you want to go through every single data item. You want to give each data item equal attention, that you want to be mindful of seeing all the later data items through the lenses of the earlier ones. And it's a fluid and organic process. So it's not the case that you generate a code and then that's it. The code is this bottle top, your bottle top, and it can't change, it's fixed. In most other approaches to TA, codes are like this. You determine them at the start, and then that's what they are. They are forever a bottle top. In our approach, your code can, evol your code can evolve so that it becomes a pen, so that it becomes something quite different, that they can get bigger, that you can break them up into three codes because the code has become quite big and it's capturing all these different ideas, that you think of a better, more nuanced label that captures the ideas that's going on. So it's a, it's a flexible and organic process. And for this reason, we suggest you do a couple of coding sweeps because the codes you start out with and the codes you finish with might be quite different. So it's a good idea to have a sweep through again. Um, the main sort of distinction that we have around codes that again tends to be an either or is the idea of codes as semantic or codes as latent. So semantic codes are codes that capture obvious or surface meanings. Um, 
And latent codes are codes that capture ideas that are underlying. For my practitioner students, they take latent, which is a term that comes from Freudian psychoanalysis, and think it literally means the unconscious, the kind of underneath. But we realise now that that was probably a bad choice of latent, and that it's trying to capture implicit meaning. And I've got an example that hopefully illustrates this a bit more clearly. So I'll come back to those in a minute. So I won't go through this in detail. This is a data extract that we look at in detail um, in a chapter in an APA handbook of research methods that you can find the reference for on our TA website. And it's Andreas, a gay man, talking about his experiences of university life. I ask him relatively early on in the interview whether he's out at university. And rather than a sort of yes or no, he has this quite complex answer. So this data extract quite nicely illustrates the continuum of semantic and latent codes. Then again, they're not an either or. They can bleed into each other. Codes, some codes might be more fully semantic, some might be more fully latent, some codes might have both. So it really is a misunderstanding of our approach. And I've seen several papers where people say, Brown and Clark say it has to be either or. It's like, no, that's not quite what we're trying to capture. So in the data extract, one of the things that Andreas talked about was his anxieties and his fears about how other people might react to his homosexuality if he came out. So this code label here, fear, anxiety about people's reactions, is a semantic code. He communicated that meaning directly and intentionally to the interviewer. This is the meaning that he wanted to convey. And so this is a semantic code because it captures the surface meaning. It captures his own reflections on his experience, how he sees the world from his perspective. What latent codes capture are the assumptions, the ideas that the more surface meaning relies on. So some of Andreas's anxiety in his response is around the fact that he's concerned about people's reactions to his homosexuality, but also he doesn't want to um, conceal his sexuality. He doesn't want to appear to be dishonest. So he doesn't say this directly, but what his accounts rely on is the idea that authenticity is important. And as kind of critical scholars, we think about the social context in we, li we live in, and we can reflect on the fact that in our Western social context, there's an awful lot of importance placed on the idea of authenticity, on being honest, on being yourself. So as more latent code coding unfolds, you're being a cultural commentator. You're reflecting on the cultural landscape that you and your participants reside within and starting to think about the social values, the norms and the assumptions that allow what people are saying to make sense. So thinking back to um, practicalities of coding, I already mentioned single word codes. Something that we started to do in teaching when we we first started teaching TA. Um, in class, students would often scribble their codes on the data. And in the context of the data, those one word code labels make sense. So we'd take the data away and say, tell us your code, tell us what it captures. And when you're working away from that context of the data, a one word like gender or stigma, when you've got 100 codes, may not evoke what's interesting and relevant analytically about the data. So you need your code labels to work independently from the data because you're going to build your themes, generate your themes from your codes. So your codes need to do something quite important analytically. They need to evoke your data. So in terms of managing the coding process, any way that works for you. I think it's fair to say that we are not enthusiasts about CACDAS, about computer-assisted 
qualitative data analysis software. I've got that one right. Um, and we can, in the Q&A period, we can talk about why that is. Um, again, it's a concern about proceduralism and the idea that software kind of presents this wonderful way of making your analysis better and it detracts from the role of the researcher in the process. So however it works for you is how you should practically manage the coding process. Over to you. So you get to the end of the coding process and we often get asked, well, when is that? And it's just the point at which you feel like you've done a good enough job. The codes are rich, nuanced, complex, not single words and so on. And in that phase, really, with um, compiling all those codes into one place. Now, um, however you've managed it, um, concretely will determine what that what that looks like. But the reason for this is that in our kind of approach to theme generation, we're really initially working with those codes, working with those little uh, bits of meaning um, that you've identified in your data in your data set. Now you'll see this big uh, blue cross here. We've crossed out searching for themes. When we wrote the original paper, and since we've usually called it searching for themes, but um, come to realize that that evokes that kind of discovery, find the theme that's waiting there to emerge kind of model of research, and that it's the wrong, um, it evokes the kind of process in a different way from what we're talking about. So we are shifting our language to more active language around this process of theme development. So this phase is really a kind of initial phase of theme development. And what you're trying to do initially is try and think of what are the bigger patterns of meaning that, that cut across the data set. And by bigger, we don't just mean the most frequent, but kind of shared ideas, concepts, meanings um, that cut across a whole lot of data items because it is about shared patterned meaning. Um, and we're looking at that through the codes that we've developed and that's why the coding process being really thorough and complete and nuanced um, and micro, you know, capturing kind of quite micro levels of meaning is really, really important. So you have like this huge kind of pile or document with like 100 codes or 200 codes or whatever you might have. And what you're looking at then is trying to find meaning that relates to your research question, that might provide an answer to your research question, that captures some important or key uh, idea within the data set or that you see as analytically re important in relation to the data set and pulling all the codes and ideas that relate to that together. So starting to kind of play around with like having a whole lot of pieces of um, Lego and starting to kind of combine those into different ways. Now you might have a huge pile of Lego that you found in the attic or something and you could combine those through shared colour or through shared size or through shared shape or so on. There's lots and lots of different ways in which you could identify shared meaning. Now sometimes codes might be quite big, they might be capturing kind of a, a quite broad range of um, ideas and you might think that that actually might work for a theme itself. Sometimes there's a, a messy relationship between codes and themes, they kind of can bleed into each other, um, but generally codes are smaller and more precise. Uh, cluster similar types of codes together like those bits of Lego. Um, and once you feel like you've got a number of different kinds of patterns, ideas, pattern meanings that um, speak to your research question, um, you kind of start shifting into a kind of mapping and reviewing and considering exercise. So you go from the codes back to the coded data. Now if you've done your coding well, there'll be a good relationship between what's actually in the data extracts and the codes that you've applied to them. 
And so the patterns will hopefully map quite well. If you haven't done the coding well, you might think you've developed, you've identified a meaning pattern related to X, and when you read the data, it really doesn't actually work. So it's really, really important to go back to the data. I think it's a misreading of our approach that you kind of stop referencing the data at this point. You have to always keep going back to the data. Here it's initially the data set, uh, or the coded data, but later it becomes the data set as well. Um, so review those, that coded data to see if the themes sort of still make sense. Um, we really like mapping techniques where you kind of try and visually map out the pattern that you're um, developing. In quite a few of our publications, we give examples of what thematic mapping looks like and across the different phases. And it's also useful for thinking about the relationships between the different themes because, you know, you are telling a story with your analysis and you're telling a story um, that somehow highlights the relevance of the particular themes that you report to your final conclusion, to your final argument that you're making about the data and the data in relation to your research question, and both of those things in relation to the whole field of scholarship that you're operating within. So themes are important to think about individually, but also as part of this bigger whole as well. So they are distinctive, but also part of a whole. So some, some traps for young players. There are many traps for young players around this. One of the things that we um, developed after our initial paper was the idea of this image of a central organizing concept or a kind of key idea or core idea that underpins or holds a whole theme together. Yesterday, Victoria came up with a brilliant um, evocation of this, which is kind of like a dandelion. You know, like when a dandelion flower has finished and you've got this sort of puffy seed head. I was out taking photos of them this morning. She doesn't know this yet. And there's a core that's holding all those little, whatever they are, this is where my degree, not in um, botany, um, comes and <laughs> fails me desperately. Um, but all those things are held together by something central. Um, and so that's what a central organizing concept is. It's the key thing that your theme is about. And it's a really useful idea because if you're going, is this part of my theme? You can say, does it relate to my central organizing concept? And if it does, then yes, it's part of the facet, part of the richness of the theme. But if it doesn't, then it's not. So if there's a fly that lands, very little fly that lands on your dandelion, it's kind of what you're seeing there, but it's not really part of the dandelion because it's not part attached to that central core. Another way in which themes can be, so themes can be kind of wrong if they're not unified by a central idea, a central key point. Um, and things can, themes can be wrong if what they are is a summary of everything the participants said in relation to X. And we kind of um, talk about these as bucket themes where you just kind of put all the ideas that relate to that point in one place. Other people talk about kind of domain summaries. And so it's like, um, you know, my student Chelsea, she didn't do this, but she might have said, you know, um, you know, what's your favorite thing about being a young, straight, single woman? She might have asked her participants that. And, they, and her participants might have told her a whole lot of things. And she might have developed a theme which said, participants' favorite things about being single. Now, that's a, an example of a domain summary. It captures probably completely different ideas, contradictory ideas, and so on. And you see those sorts of answers, those sorts of themes as well, if data collection questions are just sort of um, used to then structure the analysis. So themes need to have a kind of core idea that, is, that captures um, a meaning pattern that's not just everything everybody said about this issue. So after you've done the initial kind of development proposal and so on, you then go through a kind of review and refinement phase. And so you ask yourself a whole lot of useful questions like, you know, is this a good theme? Is it rich? Is it, um, does it say more than one thing about the issue that we're looking at? 
Is there a central organising concept? And so on. And in this review phase, you want to be working closely in relation to your, co um, your extracts of data, but also as well go back to your whole data set. Because as you step away from the data set, you miss things and you lose things. And you don't want to kind of go down an alleyway and find out that you've gone completely wrong with the analysis because you've started to see things, but actually the whole data set, once your analytic kind of attention shifts and changes, when you go back to the data set, you'll see it differently. And you don't want to get to a final end point of your analysis and find you've kind of misrepresented things. Absolutely crucial is this point, and we cannot emphasize this enough, is around being prepared to let things go. So our students will probably tell you that this is one of the worst things about having us as supervisors, is that we always say don't get too attached to your analysis as it's developing, um, because it may need to change. We always go in wrong directions. In my PhD, I did a whole chapter and I presented it to my supervisors. They'd been on holiday for a month, and I like worked really hard, and then they were like, it's not working. Bye. <laughs> cried for a few days but got over it and they were probably right I'm not ever going to say they're completely right but <laughs> yeah we had the same supervisors um, but be prepared to let your analysis go don't get too attached to it um, I've had a number of students who've kind of done an initial analysis which has been quite semantic quite surface kind of meaning level or quite inductively based and then they've just not felt happy with it like it wasn't quite getting at the sorts of things that they really wanted to know. And so reworked and did an analysis that was more kind of theoretically informed and actually went in a quite different direction. Um, and that ties into the need to kind of give yourself time around analysis. This process is not quick and it can't be done in a kind of um, really sort of rushed and perfunctory manner because it's creative. We have to think through it. We're in that process. I know that's kind of sounds impossible if you're in a sort of very tight time frame and so on. Um, very quickly, um, we often get asked how many themes. Oh, there's no answer to that. But really, one of the problems um, we see is analyses that are really overly complicated or have too many themes are overly fragmented. Victoria said she saw something that had 28 themes. Um, we generally say if you're writing something that's about eight to 10,000 words, more than, more than six themes at absolute max is going to start to produce something that's really thin, that's not kind of nuanced, that doesn't kind of capture complexity and so on. Go back to that question of is this, does this theme contain more than a single idea? Um, more than a single manifestation of the central organizing concept. Because if it doesn't, it might just be a code. And you might just be trying to slice your analysis too thinly. I don't play Candy Crush, but apparently this should make sense to people who do. Who stay awake till prayer. Not naming names. Um, the last two phases are easy to think that you can kind of skip over them. And because we're uh, nearing the end of the lecture, I am going to skip over them slightly, but that's not to say they're not um, really super important. Um, and in the process of refinement, this kind of phase of really thinking through the nuance and the specificity of what your themes are about, what each theme specifically is about, and what the overall um, analysis is telling you is really, really um, important. And some of the things that we really emphasize and might seem kind of overly obsessive is the name that a theme has. The name is kind of like the little marketing tagline for your theme. And you should capture really the key idea that it's about. You know, you want it to, in, uh, to relate to your central organizing concept in some way. And writing a definition or a description of each theme, like r giving yourself the task of like, it's almost like an abstract for a theme of doing that can be really, really useful for kind of determining whether you've got clarity about what it's about, what the boundaries of the theme are, and what its central idea is. So don't skip over this phase. It's very important. And finally, um, the last sort of phases, we always kind of 
talked about the irony that effect and qualitative research, your analysis often involves lots of writing already. So writing isn't a separate thing that you just start to do right at the end. But this final point is about um, pulling it all together, telling a story, being still prepared to let things go if they don't work in the story. Um, you know, sometimes you've developed a theme and it might be an interesting theme, but it might not actually be part of the whole story that you're telling for that analysis. And I think the kind of key to hold on to um, in relation to that is the recognition that qualitative research isn't about giving a complete, final, absolute, total picture of everything about your research um, topic and your data sample. It's about telling a relevant and important and key and rich story in relation to it. Um, and one of the things that you can read about and go away but is really, really important is to think about how you use your data. Um, you can use your data to illustrate your analytic narrative or you can actually do analytic work which tells the reader what's going on in those data extracts. And you really want to have really kind of strong, compelling uh, examples of data um, to illustrate or to kind of demonstrate each of your themes. But beware of kind of, it's really hard when you have like one participant who just expresses everything so beautifully and perfectly and is really articulate. Um, you want to quote them again and again and again, but um, rhetorically it's not a good strategy because it makes it seem like you've built your analysis just around one particular participant. So quote across your participants to demonstrate breadth and diversity. And still, right to the end, be prepared to let things go. And if you're writing an article, it might be even in the review process where you get feedback that one theme just doesn't work, for instance, or two themes could be combined. And again, you might need to be prepared to let things go. So it's a little bit of a rush, but hopefully the broad kind of contextualizing information, the key alerts and traps for young players, they're like the little things that we really care about uh, and the things that drive us mad when we see them. And this kind of very brief practical introduction are enough to kind of give you a good starting point for thinking about this. And so with that, we're going to leave you to live long and analyze thematically, reflexively and actively. Thank you.